Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, an Oklahoma rancher and farmer. Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for over 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And uh, first thing, we always like to let our television audience know that uh, they'll sometimes ask, well, why don't you have more young people? Well, we're, we're taping and producing in the middle of the week in an afternoon when we have to rely primarily on retired people. And, uh, you know, without you folks, we, we certainly couldn't do it. And again, we always like to let our television audience understand we are just an independent Bible study. We're not trying to build any empires. We're not trying to twist arms and bring you out of one group and into another. All we attempt to do is help you to study and read your Bible on your own and enjoy it. You remember, I've used the example so often that when Tyndale was attempting to get Bibles into England way back in the early 1700s, his favorite saying was, I want to get the Word of God in the hand of every plowboy in England. Well, I guess that's sort of my goal. I'd like to get every person from whatever status in society or whatever age group interested in the Word of God. It's still the greatest book on earth, and it's not as difficult as most people have been led to believe. The secret, of course, is to separate some of these things that you cannot mix. And of course, this is where we come in, especially with the Apostle Paul and his writings and so forth. I guess I should mention, because people still keep calling, do we have literature? Do we have tapes? Yes, we do have all the past programs available. I'm not an author. We don't sell books per se, but we have transcribed the programs that are taped onto the printed page. And so if you're interested in any of those things, we don't promote them for any profit. We just send them out for whatever it costs us to produce them. But uh, we depend on the offerings of God's people, of course, to pay for television time. All right, now I think that's enough for introduction. This is a Bible study time, and we're going to go right back where we left off in our last program, which is in Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to jump in at verse 15, because we went down through verse 14 in our last uh, get-together. And now remember that this little book of Galatians is primarily dealing with churches that were being bombarded with a perversion of the gospel, which Paul says is not a completely different gospel, but it's a perversion. And what they were doing was adding law and legalism and works to Paul's gospel of grace. Oh, nothing thrills us more to get letter after letter that exclaims, my, what a joy, like someone has taken a load off my shoulders when I came out of all that legalism and realized that it's in grace and grace alone that we have to find our salvation. And so this is the whole theme now, that the Apostle Paul is still defending his apostleship as he did all through the Corinthian letters. And I was thinking yet driving up here this morning, I can see now why the Holy Spirit put the Corinthian letters where they are, why Romans is where it is, even though they were written later, they're up front, because Paul has been first in Romans, of course, declaring the basic doctrines of his gospel. And then in the Corinthian letters, you remember, he had to correct and reprove them for having so many other problems, not so much like the Galatians with legalism, but they had other problems. You remember? They had divisions. Some said, well, we're going to follow Peter, and others said, we're going to follow Christ or Jesus in his earthly ministry. And some said, no, we're going to follow Apollos. And then some were true to Paul. And so he had to correct all those things, and in correcting it, he had to defend his apostleship. Now, you're going to get almost sick and tired of me hearing, uh, hearing me say this, but uh, I have to get this across, that as Paul's writings and his letters are so often totally ignored, we have to realize, and I quoted a 
an Ivy League president from back in the latter part of the 1800s, and I, I haven't got the quote with me, but in paraphrasing it, he said it is either back, back, back to the doctrines of Paul, or it is on, on, on to an apostasy. And I believe it more than ever. If we can't get folk back to an understanding of Paul's doctrines, then Christianity is in dire straits. All right, Galatians chapter 1 now then, verse 15. He's still using pretty much that same argument of defending his apostleship and declaring his authority. And so he says, now when it pleased God, verse 15, when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Now that's a Pauline expression, by grace. Called me by grace. Now all you have to do is stop and reflect for a moment. What else but grace could have done what God did with that man on the road to Damascus? Here he was trying to stamp out anyone in Israel that had proclaimed Christ as the Messiah, had believed that, and had become separated from the mainstream of Judaism, although they were still keeping temple worship and the law. And evidently, old Saul had pretty much cleansed the homeland, and now he had gone to the chief rulers, who, as I pointed out uh, several programs back, had enough clout with the Roman government that they could actually extradite Jews from foreign countries, such as Damascus, and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and punishment and more than often death. And so on the road to Damascus, with that heart of absolute hatred for anything contrary to Judaism, which of course those who had embraced Jesus as Messiah would be, here he is trying to go to Damascus and arrest and bring back to Jerusalem for trial anybody in the synagogue that he could find who were believers in Christ. And so this is what he's talking about, that on that road to Damascus, the Lord called him by grace. If ever there was a man that didn't deserve what God did for him, it was Saul. But contrary to what most people think we have to do to get right with God, Saul, like Israel of old, as they stood on the shores of the Red Sea, did absolutely nothing. Nothing but helplessly called out what? What would you have me to do? And you know, I, I used the example in my class again last night. Uh, we're in Genesis in that particular class. And as Noah and his family were in the ark, do you remember what the picture of the sealant of those wood boards were? <coughs> it was the word pitch, but in the Hebrew it's atonement. And so it was the atonement that sealed out the floodwaters of Noah's ark. Now with the atonement in place and the ark secure, Noah and his family were totally safe. Well, the same way then when you come up to Israel, standing on the, sh uh, or standing at the uh, little kitchen table in their huts in Egypt, and the death angel is flying over and wailing and weeping is carrying on in Egypt, and yet, there those Jewish families could stand safe and secure. Why? Because the blood was on the door. All right, then, you know, sometime later, there they stood on the shores of the Red Sea and with no hope. And when God spoke, he didn't say, well, do something, build a raft, find boats. What did he say? Stand still and see the power of God, which, of course, was the opening of the Red Sea. All right, now this is exactly where Paul had to find himself, just exactly like Israel. There was only going to be one place of safety for the man, and that is the blood of Christ. And how is he going to appropriate it? Not by doing something, but once the Lord spoke to him, all he could do is say, Lord, what will you have me to do? And it hasn't changed one iota. All right, so this is what he's referring to when he says that it pleased God to call me by his grace. And then verse 16, to reveal his Son in me. And the word S-O-N, of course, is direct reference to God the Son, the Christ. 
to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. And remember the word heathen in your uh, New Testament is anybody that's not a Jew, anybody that's not of the twelve tribes or the sons of Abraham. And so he is going to be sent to the non-Jew. All right, now let's go back and see the account in Acts, because after all, with Bible study, we have to use references as much as possible to see that all of Scripture agrees, that we're not just picking up a verse here and there in order to build some ideas, but all of Scripture will uh, substantiate, hopefully, what we're teaching. All right, back in Acts chapter 9, after that experience on the road to Damascus, of course, God always works both ends to the middle, you know. And while he's working on old Saul outside the city, he also is working on Ananias in the city. And so now we're going to pick it up where he is speaking to Ananias, this believing Jew, somewhere in the city of Damascus. And he says in verse 11, Arise, now I'm in Acts chapter 9, verse 11, the Lord said, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight. Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul, for behold, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. In other words, you're not going to surprise him, Ananias. I've already implanted this whole thought in his mind. And that you can put your hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to the saints of Jerusalem. His persecution, you see. And Ananias says, And here he is with authority from the chief priests to bind or arrest all that call on thy name. Now here it is. And oh, we want people from one end of this country to the other to understand this. But the Lord said, that is to Ananias, Go thy way. Go and find Saul. For he, Saul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, a lot of people don't realize this. But you see, when Christ came in his earthly ministry to the nation of Israel and he chose the twelve. Now, let's go back and look at it again. Some of these things have been a long time in the past. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 10. And when Jesus began his earthly ministry and called the twelve, here in Matthew 10, he gives instructions that I have shocked people more than once when I read it because they just don't know it's in their Bible. But it is in every translation, in every version. I've never had anybody yet tell me, well, unless it's not in my Bible. It's in there. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5. After naming the twelve that he had chosen, Matthew 10, verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded. Now, I haven't got this Bible underlined, but in my older ones I do. That's a, an important word. He commanded them. He didn't suggest it. It was a commandment. And he said, go not. There's another word that should be emphasized. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. See how plain that is? Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and in any city of the Samaritans, who of course were more Jew than Gentile, but they were half-breeds, remember. And in any city of the Samaritans, enter you not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that was a commandment. They were to go to no one but Jews. And they, they never lost sight of that. Now you're just in Acts chapter 9 for a moment. Uh, I hope you can come back there. But I also want you to jump ahead to chapter 11 to see how those early Jewish believers adhered to that commandment that Jesus gave to the twelve. Now a lot of people think that as soon as Jesus began his ministry, the church began and uh, God's grace and the gospel went out to the whole world. Not according to this book. Not according to this book. According to this book, he ministered only to the nation of Israel for the whole three years. And even after his ascension and Peter begins at Pentecost, then for several years it was that same format. 
where they would go only to the Gentiles. And now in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, it's been a long time since we taught this, so this is review. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Y'all got it? Acts 11, verse 19. Now, they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen, now it was caused by Saul, of course, they traveled as far as Phoenix, out to the island of Cyprus, and up to Antioch in Syria, preaching the word. And you remember, there's no New Testament written yet, so what word have they got? Old Testament. And so they went everywhere preaching the word from the Old Testament to none. Now, I emphasize these for a reason. They preached to none but Jews. What's the last word? Only. See how plain that is? Now, this is long after Pentecost, I figure seven years after Pentecost. They are still adhering to the commandment that Jesus gave to the twelve in Matthew, go not in the way of a Gentile, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right, now then, if you'll come back to chapter 9, maybe this will be uh, a little enlightening as to why the Lord Jesus had to make such an emphasis to this man Ananias as to what the purpose of saving this Jewish zealot who had been putting Jews to death for having embraced Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, and yet he has to understand that now there's going to be a change of direction. And this is what people have to understand. When you read your Bible, you've got to understand that from Genesis 12 until here in Acts chapter 9, it's God dealing with the nation of Israel. Not exclusively, but almost. There will be exceptions. But now there's going to be a change. There's going to be a fork in the road. And we're going to see it explicitly as we go on in Galatians. But all right, in Acts chapter 9 again, Verse 15, we read down to where it says, And he's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. And, of course, he's still going to minister to the children of Israel. And then verse 16, For the Lord Jesus is speaking to Ananias. And Christ says, For I will show him, Saul, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And did he? Oh, did he? That's what we've been seeing in the last several months in our study in the Corinthian letters. How he was beaten and scourged and was cold and naked and many times sick and living in fear for his life, all because of what the Lord Jesus had promised him here. Well, now then if you'll come back to Galatians chapter 1 where we just were, and so this is what he's making reference to, that he's going to reveal himself in this man, this apostle, Saul of Tarsus, who we now know as Paul. And so we'll come back to Galatians 1, and again verse 16, reading on. Immediately, immediately as soon as Saul up there in Damascus had heard the words of the Lord Jesus and probably Ananias rehearsed it with him, immediately he says, I went up to Jerusalem to check it out with the twelve. No, it doesn't say that. See, I do this purposely to make people look twice. That's not what it says. Now, that's what a lot of people think it should say. That would have been the logical thing, wouldn't it? to go back to Jerusalem and say, Hey, Peter, you guys were with him for three years. I want to know everything that he taught you. But you see, the Holy Spirit is making it so positive here that he's not going to let this man be tainted whatsoever by what the twelve had learned at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, the Lord, now has something totally different to show this man, and he doesn't want it mixed up. But you see, men are adept at it, aren't they? Men have been mixing it ever since the poor apostle left the sea, and I'm trying my best to unmix it and to bring it back again to this clearly division, divided between what God did with Israel and what he's doing with the Gentile and the body of Christ. All right? 
So he says immediately, verse 16, <clears throat> I conferred not with flesh and blood. In other words, with other human beings. Why? Because he's dealing with the flesh and bone, <laughs> the Lord Jesus, you see, up in glory. All right? And so then he says in verse 17, for emphasis now, to make sure that we get it straight, when he realized that he was going to be an apostle of the Gentiles, he did not go up to Jerusalem, verse 17, to them who were apostles before me. See, now he never takes away the authority of Peter and the other 11 apostles. He never denigrates their, their authority so far as their position as apostles of Israel. But he's never going to let them usurp his authority as apostles of the Gentiles. And this is what you have to watch for. All right? So neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and then returned again to Damascus. Now, the first thing I like to do when you see that word Arabia in verse 17 is here in Galatians, just turn the page to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Verse 24. Chapter 4, verse 24. No, 25. I'm sorry. Chapter 4, verse 25. All with me? For this Hagar, now of course Paul is making an allegory here, but we won't cover that. We'll get that later. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai... Where? In Arabia. Now, from that little statement, and I may stand all alone, I don't know. I've never read it anywhere else, but I have to feel, if you'll come back now to chapter 1, that since this man is going to be delegated to receive a whole new body of truth from the ascended Lord, and he is going to be given the responsibility to take it out to the whole Gentile world. Well, what does it remind you of? Well, when God did much the same thing with Moses at that same Mount Sinai. And you see me put it on the board, maybe I should do it again. That when, uh, when the Lord uh, spoke to Moses there at Sinai, and I always like to put it this way, God gave Moses the law, and Moses took the law down to Israel, right? And only Israel received the ramifications of the law, although certainly the law affected the whole human race. But all right, here we are now, some 1,500 years later. God hasn't changed. God is still the same. He never changes. So the same God, but now he's dealing with a different individual. He now says to Paul, we'll call him Paul from now on, he now gives to Paul these doctrines of grace, which of course are embedded in what Paul is always referring to as the mysteries. And then the Apostle Paul is not instructed to take it down to the nation of Israel, but instead he is instructed to take it far hence to the Gentiles and, of course, plus the Jew. And that, I think, just answers all of our questions as to what part of the Scripture are we to depend on. Now, it's all God's Word. Don't ever take that away from me. Every word in this book is the inspired Word of God but he has made it so plain that this man is the apostle of the Gentile. In fact, seeing Jerry back there, I got I to gotta use this verse. There are several of them that Jerry, when he first was bombarded by him, he'd come up and he said, now, Les, I never saw that before. Repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So that's why I do it. Go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Romans 11, verse 13. And all oh, this says it so plainly. There, there, there's no arguing over it. 
Romans 11, verse 13, where he says, For I speak to you Gentiles. See how plain that is? My land, a six-year-old can understand that. I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. And he says, I magnify my office. In other words, he's not going to back down for anything as that role of the apostle of the Gentile. And why can't people adhere to that? That's his authority. All right, and that's why as we saw in the Corinthian letters, he was always defending that authority. All right, now come back with me quickly to Galatians. I thought we'd get five, six verses and we're only going to get one or two. All right, back to Galatians 1. So he went down, evidently, to Arabia, Mount Sinai, and of course there's a difference of opinion amongst Bible scholars and theologians whether he spent the whole three years at Sinai, as I believe he did, or did he spend a portion of time at Sinai and then went back to Damascus, and then at the end of the three years is now ready to begin his ministry. But I have to feel that the Lord took that whole three years of dealing with this man all by himself, down there in the desert at Mount Sinai. Now the reason I take that approach is that when you understand all the trials and the tribulations that this man went through, most men would have given up long, long ago. But he always kept pressing on, always pressing on. Why? Because I think this three-year experience was so embedded in the man's makeup that he could do nothing less. And then, of course, on top of that, there were several times that the Lord Jesus referred to him face to face. He says it, and he appeared unto me. And so all of these things contributed to his constant pushing forward and against all the opposition. All right, so now then, just quickly winding up verse 18. So after a three-year stint, which I think was down at Arabia, he finally now gets up to Jerusalem for the first time and he's going to meet the Apostle Peter face to face. Now I imagine that was quite a meeting because after all, they're coming from two totally different backgrounds, but we'll carry it on further in our next program. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.